ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد my dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh so we have a, a, a daunting task in front of us and that is we need to cover two chapters of this book in one halaqa and the daunting task with that is there's a lot of information a little amount of time and that means the pace that we're going to go be going at is relatively quick so that is the the daunting task in front of us and that is why we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make things easy and put barakah in our time what this will require though is for you to pay attention and then at the end I'll give an opportunity to discuss um, and exchange ideas and ask some questions that with that having been said we're going to be starting our discussion on moral intelligence tonight and what do we mean by moral intelligence moral intelligence is the capacity to process moral information and to manage the self in a way that realizes the moral ideal that is the technical definition of what moral intelligence is a simplified version of this how do we take information that relates to morality and find a way to implement it in our day-to-day -day lives how do we take information that relates to morality and find a way to implement it in our day-to-day -day lives so for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us in the Quran in the salata kanata al mu'minina kitaba mawquta that indeed the prayer has been prescribed upon the believers at its set times so now we know this mandate of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the prayers need to be established on their set times we have this information now how do I take this information that deals with the almost the epitome of morality in Islam which is the salah and find it within of myself to make sure that I pray my prayers on time so that is an example of what we are looking at and last week you'll remember we took that statement of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah when he was asked the question what is fiqh what is the true understanding of fiqh and he said it is to know that which benefits the soul and that which harms the soul so now the reason why it's important to understand this definition or this understanding of fiqh because when we think of fiqh we'll be thinking about jurisprudence how do I actually pray what makes my wudu valid what nullifies my wudu what makes my salah valid what nullifies my salah but Imam Hanifa rahimahullah is telling us that there has to be a broader approach to the Sharia there has to be a broader approach to understanding our religion and that is everything that Allah legislated and permitted and commanded is going to be beneficial to our soul and everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited and made haram is going to be harmful to our soul and at the end of the day the most valuable thing for us will be salvation of our soul the most valuable thing for us is the salvation of our soul meaning getting to Jannah and that is why that is the framework that needs to be understood now this concept of knowing what is good and following it is something that actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises in the Quran he praises in the Quran in surah number 38 in verse 45 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَذْكُرْ عِبَادَنَا and remember my slaves or remember our servants Ibrahim wa Ishaq wa Yaqub ulul aydi wal absar and remember our slaves so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is saying that to remember these great prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a particular purpose what is that particular purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given them foresight had given them foresight and he had given them the strength to implement it he had given them the strength to implement it so you look at the stories of these prophets and particularly in the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam throughout his story there are multiple challenges starting out as a young boy knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that deserves to be worshipped and he is our creator and sustainer and him preaching to his father and to his community and the challenges that he goes through then eventually he gets older and now the challenge becomes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked him to sacrifice his family firstly starting off with leaving Hajar and Ismail behind in Mecca while he's told to leave and then when it comes to actually being commanded to sacrifice Ismail then actually when it comes to sacrifice Ismail so these are a set of challenges so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given these people insight of knowing what is right and wrong which ultimately is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the highest truth that one can achieve in this life and then number two is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given them the strength to implement it and follow through and that's what we need to realize 
is that the first phase is actually the easy phase. Getting to know what is right and wrong, we have so many tools at our disposal that will facilitate this discussion of what is right and what is wrong. Almost everyone can achieve that. The difficult part is, once you know what is right and what is wrong, how do you convince yourself, how do you convince your soul to obey that which is right and abstain from that which is wrong? So that is going to be at the core of today's discussion today in the first half of the segment. Now one of the challenges that arises in this discussion of right and wrong is the discussion of subjective morality. That everyone has the right to interpret what is right and wrong. And that is something that is heavily endorsed in our day and age. You have the right to believe whatever you want as long as it doesn't harm me and as long as you're not imposing it upon me. And it is the unfortunate reality that Muslims have embraced such a paradigm even though such a paradigm is not coherent with the Islamic understanding of morality and ethics. It is not coherent with the Islamic understanding of ethics. Now, let us understand what we're talking about. I want you to imagine, choose any particular game. Choose any particular game that you play. It can be a sport like hockey and basketball. It can be a board game like Monopoly or Risk. One of the key functions of both of these types of games is that the only way this game will be enjoyable and its goal can be achieved is if everyone is aware of the rules and everyone abides by the rules. So can you imagine someone's playing Monopoly and they're like secretly stealing money from the bank? What type of game is that going to be? It's going to ruin the game. You can't have a functioning game at that time. Or you're playing a sport and in the sport, in the middle of the game, you decide to change the rules. You're like, okay, if you shoot from here, it's worth 10 points. And if you shoot from there, it's only worth one point. You start to change up the rules. It's not going to work. So what that means is the rules of the game need to be decided in advance. The rules of the game need to be decided in advance. And it's not something that can flow throughout the game. You can't keep changing the rules throughout the game. Now, how does this impact our discussion on subjective morality? Well, one of the flawed elements of subjective morality is that that which was moral before may not be moral now. And that which is moral now perhaps was not moral before. And that is one of the flaws. But what you have to understand is our scope of discussion is that which is in the best interest of society and more particularly humanity as a civilization. So that is the scope of our discussion. We want to talk about what is in the best interest of humanity and civilization. When that is the focus of our discussion, you have to understand that those rules are going to be set in advance and as long as mankind is the constant, humanity is the constant in our discussion, then that morality and ethics needs to be constant and cannot be relative or subjective. Meaning it can't change from place to place or time to time. Now what can change from place to place and time to time? What can change from place to place and time to time is what do we choose to implement right away and what do we choose to delay? What are some of the things that we can be easy going on and what are some of the things that we need to be more strict on? So let us look at the Sharia from a whole when it comes to this issue. So there are certain things that the Sharia is actually very, very strict upon. And that is something like Salah. Whether you are sick or you are healthy, you have to pray. That is something that you cannot give up. If you're healthy, you pray standing. If you're not feeling well, you pray sitting down. If you're healthy, you have to pray each prayer on this proper time. If you are sick, you're allowed combining between Dhuhr and Asr and between Maghrib and Isha. But it is something that has to be done. So that constant it is always there. But in terms of delaying some matters and giving preference to some matters, that is where the flexibility of the Sharia will come into play. So now when you understand this concept of subjective morality, you have to understand that there has to be this concept of moral subscription. So coming back to the example of the game, the game will only work if everyone agrees to the rules. If everyone agrees to the rules, then the game will work. But if not everyone agrees to the rules, the game is not going to work. And this is what we refer to as moral subscription. People need to buy into this concept. People need to buy in to this concept. So now, how do we get people to morally subscribe to a set of rules. 
The first thing it has to do is be logical. The first thing it has to do is be logical. And that is the all, or the primary way that people will buy into these set of rules. If rules are not logical, there will be no buy-in. Now what is the difference between a buy-in versus conformity? What is the difference between buy-in and conformity? The difference between buy-in and conformity is two things. Buy-in is when you have something logical and a person is self-motivated to live by these rules. So it's logical and a person is self-motivated to abide by these rules. Moral subscription, that's what it is. Confirmation is when an individual is not logically convinced that these are the best rules or this is the best way going forward, but they're doing so only for the sake of an external pressure. They're doing so only for the sake of an external pressure. Now, eventually what happens in that case is people will think they are morally convinced when in reality it's just societal pressure that forced them to become that way and change the way they thought and change the way they thought. So for example, this whole concept of, of fascism and xenophobia and hating immigrants, if you think about it logically, like the whole movement doesn't make any sense. Like this whole basis of go back to where you came from, immigrants are not welcome. Who is saying this? It is the same people that colonized our countries and killed all the native people in this land. Like, this makes argument makes no sense. If there were any concept of an immigrant, you were the first immigrant, we just followed you. That's what happened at the end of the day. So people, they start being convinced of this due to not a logical you know, proof, not it being logical and coherent, but due to a societal pressure that comes a, a, across. So that is what conformity actually looks like. So when we talk about moral intelligence, what we're looking at is that whatever we're presenting has to be logically sound. It has to make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, then that is something we need to question. If it doesn't make sense, that is something we need to question. Now, this is going to lead to a further discussion on how do we understand the Sharia? How do we understand the Sharia? What is good and bad inside of the Sharia? And this is where I want to develop uh, a discussion around the schools of thought when it came to this issue. So the concept is, how do we know what is good and bad? How do we know what is good and bad? That is the scope of our discussion right now. Movement number one, we will call the Mu'tazili group. And we discussed, we discussed them in Halakha number one. We said they were the rationalists. Everything about them was purely rationalization. And they said the way we understand what is good and bad is by two things. Is by the attribute of the action and by the outcome of the action. So whatever we're trying to discover, is it good or bad? We have to see what attributes it has within of itself intrinsically. And then we will look at the outcome. And then we will look at the outcome. And that is how we will decide what is good and bad. Now what is important to understand is that this group completely ignored revelation. Completely ignores what Allah says, what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, the primary authority is our intellect and the Sharia, the Quran and the Sunnah need to conform to our intellect. They need to conform to our intellect. So that is their argument. This is group number one. Group number two, is what we will call the Ash'ari school of thought. And this is something we also discussed in Halakha number uh, one. The Ash'ari school of thought, they said when it comes to good and bad, the ultimate authority is revelation. And the intellect has no role whatsoever. Whether you understand it or not, whether it has good attributes or bad attributes, whether the outcome is good or bad is completely irrelevant. You completely have to look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded. You completely have to look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded. That is group number two. So this is the spectrum we've created. Spectrum number one, all intellect. Spectrum number two, all revelation. And then we'll introduce another group. And this other group is the Maturudi group. The Maturudi group, they tried to come somewhere in between. They said that the vast majority of good and bad actions will be known through revelation. But there are some actions that can be known 
through their characteristics and their outcomes if they are good or bad. If they are good or bad. And then the last individual, and this is an individual, it's not a group, it's not a movement, is Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he frames the discussion completely different. And he says, our primary source of understanding what is good and bad is revelation. You want to understand what is good and bad? This is the primary source. Now in those circumstances and situations where the Sharia stayed quiet and perhaps did not talk about things specifically, then Allah has given us certain tools to analyze if something is good or bad. And that is you can look at the characteristics of that thing, you can look at the outcomes that it brings, and you can use those tools at that time. And then he proposes a third concept. There are certain things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed which may seem that they are bad, yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed them as a test and therefore do not follow the logical flow of order. And he uses the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam when he's commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to sacrifice his son. Sacrificing your son, is that a good thing or a bad thing? We're going to agree that it is a bad thing. It's not something good. That is not something you should be doing, regardless of how bad they are. Yet Ibrahim is commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do this. Would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command his servants and slaves to do something bad? No. That goes against the whole premise of the Sharia, that Allah only commanded that which is beneficial to us and prohibited that which is harmful. So why is Ibrahim now being commanded to do this? This is a test for Ibrahim. This is a test for Ibrahim salam specifically. So where is the good in this? The good in this is from multiple levels. Number one, showing how Ibrahim salam had this high level of conviction where he's able to use his faith to overcome any doubts that he has in doing this action. Number two is the proof that strong conviction and faith can bring about the best of outcomes, even though when it may not always be perceived. Because you can see as soon as Ibrahim is about to sacrifice his son, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously changes it to an animal. Miraculously changes him to an animal. So here that faith and conviction shows us that one has true tawakkul in Allah, Allah will never abandon that slave. If Allah has commanded you to it, and you're having difficulty to do it, and you find the conviction to do it, Allah will never abandon your side. So these are just two of the goods that come out of it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best this argument of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah seems to be the strongest of positions. Seems to be the strongest of positions. So now when we are talking about our morality, when we are talking about what is good and what is bad, our primary source is the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Our primary source is the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And this is what needs to be understood. Everything else that is not mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, yes, we can weigh, we can discuss, we can make ijtihad and try to come to a conclusion. But for everything that is mentioned, then we have to understand that that is our ultimate authority and that is what we need to abide by. Now, let us look at some of the downfalls of this moral subject subjectivity. When things are not objective, we're going to look at the downfalls of moral subjectivity. So the example that the author comes and brings is when you look at moral subjectivity, societies that have the highest levels of moral subjectivity will promote two main values. They will promote two main values. At a political level, it is that everyone should have the freedom of individual choice. Everyone should have the freedom of individual choice. So that is at a political level. At an ethical level, the highest level of morals and ethics in this subjective society is the act of tolerance. If you're able to tolerate other people, then this is the highest level of virtue that can be achieved in this liberal society of moral relativism. Now, if you take a country, or actually we'll not use a country, we'll use a region, Scandinavia. Scandinavia is a region that promotes liberalism to the farthest degree. And it promotes this concept of a relative uh, morality. Now what are the problems of a relative morality? What we see in countries in Scandinavia 
is that they have the highest levels of isolation. The highest levels of isolation. Where people feel alone. They, can, they don't feel as if they're a part of a community. And this is you know, going to get into an issue of de depression and, and, and things like that. And I'm not going to get into the mental health side of things. What I want to say is, if you look at this idea of moral relativism, what it promotes is individualism, which creates isolation and prevents you being a part of a community. Because part of being a community is that there has to be a shared framework. There has to be a shared you know, group of ethics that we all live by and abide by. And if we agree that, you know what, everyone has the right to believe whatever they want in terms of good and bad, that prevents discourse, that prevents engagement, that prevents discussion and dialogue, and that is the basis of community, where people get together to discuss ideas for the sake of enhancing our civilization. So that is pitfall number one. Pitfall number two is that this individualism that is promoted is presumed that it will not have an impact on society. But this couldn't be further from the truth. This couldn't be further from the truth. So now one of the things that you see is that in terms of gender, in terms of intimacy, of who and what you are attracted to, this ethos of do what you want and no one has the right to judge you is being heavily promoted and it is being embraced. Now what is the impact that it has on society? The impact that it has on society, the concept of family values has completely deteriorated. The concept of protecting society from the harms that can take place with falsely equated intimacy are becoming more rampant. You look at the levels of diseases and, um, and so on and so forth that are being promoted are increasing. If you look at the levels of identity crisis, people not knowing who or what they are, are increasing. And all of this is tied back to the individual belief of I have the right to be whoever and whatever that I want. Fallacy number three or pitfall number three is that such a way of life will not be logically coherent. It will never make sense. Because if this is purely based upon what you feel and what you feel is good, that is going to be different from my experience. That is going to be different from how I understand things. So it will not be something that is logical, but it will be something that people are forced to conform by due to social pressure, and there will not be buy-in. There will not be a moral subscription. People are going to conform for the sake of social pressure because that is the cool thing to do. And that is what is unfortunately happening in, uh, in, in a lot of the Muslim communities. So those are some of the pitfalls that you will find. Now, understanding the greater uh, harm in this is that when everything becomes subjective, it means we've eliminated law. We've eliminated law. So halal and haram, we've completely eliminated it becomes subjective. You have the right to decide what is good and bad. That means halal and haram no longer exist. Because it'll be halal for me, haram for you. Something else is halal for you and haram for me based upon our own interpretations. So if halal and haram is taken away, that means the concept of sin is taken away. People are no longer committing sin. And if you're no longer committing a sin, then there's no longer a need for repentance. If there's no longer a need for repentance, then there is no salvation. Then there is no salvation. And even greater than this is when you have so many truths that are possible, when you have so many truths that are possible, people stop striving for an ultimate truth. When so many truths are possible, people stop striving for an ultimate truth. So in this day of age of share your truth, this is meaningless. Who said your truth has any value to begin with other than yourself? Like who do we think we are that what we feel and what we express has become a truth? Yes, that may be your reality, but your reality in the greater scheme of things has no impact on society. And the greater society and the greater civilization of humanity is what has to take precedence. And that requires an objective morality. That requires an objective morality. So now this is just a, a lay of the land of why we can't have a subjective morality. And we need an objective morality. Now the author, he goes on to this discussion. He goes on to this discussion of the tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and how we reach that objective morality. 
So Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he talks about the eyesight, the basar. And he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the, in the Quran, basar and basira. So basar is physically what we see. And basira is insight. Basira is insight. So to break it down at a simpler level, what you see physically versus what you see intrinsically. And this is based upon the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he says, Inna Allah la yanzuru ila ajsamikum wa alwanikum walakin yanzur ila qulubikum wa a'malikum. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala does not look at your physical bodies nor does He look at your colors. But what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala does look at is your actions and the state of your heart. Your actions and the state of your heart. So Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, he uses this hadith as an argument to prove that insight, basira, is actually much greater of a gift and much more functional as a tool than the physical eyesight. Than the physical eyesight. And then he goes on to argue this. He goes on to argue this through five ways. Through five ways. Way number one. And the first and perhaps most profound difference between basira and basira is that the physical eye, unlike the intellect, cannot perceive itself. Cannot perceive itself. So meaning, is there anything that the eyesight can do to perceive itself? Is, can the eyesight perceive itself? Meaning that if the eyes are looking, can they look at that themselves? No, it will require an external tool like a mirror to see that the eyesight actually exists. Whereas this basira, this intellect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, due to our ability to rationalize, due to our ability to conceptualize, it can perceive itself. It can see when it is functioning and it can see when it is not functioning. Number two, is that Imam al-Ghazali, he says, the eye cannot see that which is far away or that which is extremely close. The eyesight cannot see that which is extremely far away or that which is extremely close. Something is really far away, it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Something is really close, you put this book right up to your face and you're unable to see what's being written. So he's saying that physical eyesight has its limitations. Physical eyesight has its limitations. Whereas the basira that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives has no limitations. The more one increases in their taqwa and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more their basira goes up. The more their insight actually goes up. Number three, is that if there's a physical partition that is placed, the eyesight cannot see past that partition. There's no such thing as x-ray vision in human beings. We haven't developed that even as a, as a tool that you can install in, in a human being yet. But for the basira, there is no such thing as a physical barrier because it doesn't exist in the physical realm. What there will be is a spiritual barrier. And physical barriers, not all of them can be moved. You're stuck behind a mountain. You can't move the mountain to see what is behind it. You have to walk across. You're in the middle of a forest. You can't just skip all the trees in the middle and see what's beyond the forest. Yet when it comes to basira, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us tools and methods to remove those spiritual blocks. At the highest of them is seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salah and salam upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is how you remove those spiritual barriers. Number uh, four. Number four. Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he goes on to mention is that the eyes can only see the outward experience. They can only experience the external factor. Whereas the intellect and the basira, they have the ability to see internally. So you see something on the apparent and you make a judgment based upon the apparent. Whereas basira, it gives you the ability to see what is internal. It gives you the ability to see what is internal. Now I want us to, 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 to pause over here for a second. Because if you look at the disease of racism, if you look at the disease of racism, it is purely tied to this concept. Racism is void of all basira. Because what you're doing is looking at something physical and proclaiming an ultimate judgment upon that person. This person is such and such ethnicity, therefore they must be bad. And that is what the conclusion that we come to. And that is why it is un-Islamic and haram to have these racist ideas. But what's really important over here 
is that once we condemn racism, we also have to increase literacy, literacy on how we increase our basira. How do you see beyond the physical? How do you see beyond what is just apparent in front of you? And that is why there are multiple things that can be done. There are multiple things that can be done that we will highlight uh, at a different time. And then difference number five, according to Imam al-Ghazali, is that only a small portion of the creation can go beyond the physical. Only a small portion of the creation can go beyond the physical. Whereas it is the select few that can go into the uh, inner dimensions. The select few that can go into these inner dimensions. So part of your iman, part of your submission will bring those inner dimensions. Will bring those inner dimensions. Now all of this discussion is very, very important. Why? Because when you look at understanding good and bad, part of the discussion, as I mentioned, is recognizing it. And then how do you come to follow it? And I mentioned that almost everyone can understand what is good and bad, but very few people will be able to follow what is good and abstain from what is bad. What is the ultimate key that is needed to cross that barrier? How do I get myself to follow that which is good and abstain from which is bad? Is developing this concept of basira. Is developing this concept of basira. Now, we're going to introduce this concept and we talked about it a little bit in halaqa number one. The function of light and the importance of light. When you look at eyesight, the eyesight is dependent upon an external light. Eyesight is dependent upon an external light. If there is no external light, the eyesight cannot function. You turn off the lights completely. If there is no light, you will not be able to see. You will not be able to see. Similarly, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he argues that just like eyesight is dependent upon this external light, mankind is dependent upon external guidance. Mankind is dependent upon external guidance. Without this external guidance, they are completely not able to figure out what is right and wrong. And he uses surah number 6, uh, verse 122, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, that is the example of the likes who was dead and brought to life. And we granted him a light to walk between the people like the one who has no light and roams in darkness. This is the example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives over here when he talks about iman, when he talks about revelation. That revelation is that external light that mankind needs to function as a society, that mankind needs to function as a society. And the author, he actually brings a very nice quote. I wasn't able to jot down who he wrote this quote from, but he says, use this logical progression where social order is dependent upon morality. Social order is dependent upon morality. If there's no morality, there is no social order. And he says, morality is dependent upon religion. Morality is dependent upon religion. So you cannot have true morality without having religion. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing in this ayah. That, ex that external light of revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given is that revelation uh, uh, upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So now, this is where we get to the meat of the matter. All of this was just the introduction. The meat of the matter. Moral intelligence is built upon five things. It's built upon five principles. Let's call it that. Moral intelligence is built upon five principles. Principle number one is a moral compass that is calibrated to prophetic ideals. I'll list them out and then we're going to discuss them inshallah. A moral compass that is calibrated to prophetic ideals. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you this compass inside that when it's calibrated to prophetic ideals, you will be able to navigate. But if it's not calibrated to prophetic ideals, you're not going to be able to navigate. Number two, conviction and commitment to those ideals. Conviction and commitment to those ideals. Conviction and commitment to those ideals. Number three, moral sensitivity. Moral sensitivity. Number four, moral problem solving. Moral problem solving. And number five, moral assertiveness. Number five, moral 
assertiveness. So now, starting off with this compass that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, what is that referring to? Some of the scholars will refer to this as the fitra. Fitrat Allah allati fatra nas alayha. That it is this innate disposition that people have inside that in its purest and innocent form will tell you what is good and will tell you what is bad. And this is what we see in the hadith of uh, Wabis ibn Ma'bad that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he tells Wabis ibn Ma'bad that righteousness is that which settles in the heart. Righteousness is that which makes you comfortable in your heart. And evil is that which makes you uncomfortable. And evil is that which makes you uncomfortable. So now, this concept of a moral compass, everyone has. Everyone has some sort of moral compass. The question we want to ask is, what is it calibrated to? What is it calibrated to? When you have a good moral compass that is calibrated to prophetic ideals, the Prophet ﷺ says, وَاسْتَفْتِ قَلْبَكَ That seek your heart. That whatever your heart tells you, it will guide you. But if your heart is not calibrated to prophetic ideals, you need to first get it to that level of prophetic ideals. You need to get it to that level of prophetic ideals. Now what is the advice of the author in terms of getting to that level where your heart is calibrated to these prophetic ideals? Number one, keeping company of the righteous. Keeping company of the righteous. Number two, recitation of the Qur'an and its contemplation. Number two, recitation of the Qur'an and its contemplation. Number three, studying the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number three, studying the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number four, humbly and sincerely making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Humbly and sincerely making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I just want to pause over here for a second. This concept of humbly asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that cannot be underestimated. It is not something that can be underestimated. And I want to address this from two points. Number one is in the salah, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us to ask for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have taught us to ask for a wide variety of things. Yet the one thing He commanded us to ask for, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ That, oh Allah, guide me to the straight path. Guide us to the straight path, rather. Meaning, uh, a communal morality, a communal way of life. Guide us all to the straight path. That is what you're commanded to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. So the fact that Allah commanded it in salah shows its importance. And number two, the multiple du'as that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make. The multiple du'as that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make. Ya muqallib al qulub thabit qalbi ala deenik. That, oh Allah, turn of the hearts, turn my heart towards your religion and to your way of life. And the fact that the Prophet sallallahu used to ask, Allahumma arini al haqqa haqqa wa rizukni at tiba'ah. Wa arini al batila batila wa rizukni ijtinaba. That, oh Allah, show me the truth as it is and allow me to follow it. And show me falsehood as it is and allow me to abstain from it. And this dua perhaps is at the crux of our discussion. This whole discussion on moral intelligence is revolving around this dua. That asking Allah, show me the truth as it is. Because you're the only one that can show me the truth as it is. And allow me to follow it. And then show me falsehood as it is and allow me to abstain from it. Now I want to dig even deeper onto this concept, and I apologize for going on this tangent, we're going to come back to the list. When a person is committing sin, when a person is committing sin, are they looking with their eyes, or are they looking with their heart? A person is looking with their eyes at that time, because it's purely about a physical enjoyment in this life. It is purely about, Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Are you okay? It is purely about a physical enjoyment in this life. Whereas if they were able to see with their heart, if they were able to see with their heart, they would have abstained from it. If they were able to see with their heart, they would have abstained from it. So this is the power of that dua that you're asking Allah, Oh Allah, don't just grant me the ability to see with my eyes, grant me the ability to see with my heart. And once my heart is able to recognize what it truly is, then let me follow that or abstain from it accordingly. 
Let me follow that or abstain from it accordingly. And that is the power of sincerely asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the power of sincerely asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number five, seeking knowledge and forcing oneself to live by it. Number five, seeking knowledge and forcing oneself to live by it. Is forcing yourself to seek knowledge and live by it. And then number six is repenting from the sins and avoiding sins. Repenting from sins and avoiding sins. And what's interesting is that the author, he mentions repenting before avoiding. Now what is the possible wisdom behind that? As human beings, it is inevitable that we will fall into sin. So it's something that you cannot avoid. So when you do fall into sin, make sure you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once you've developed this habit of repentance, then part of sincere repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the avoiding of sins. Part of sincere repentance is avoiding those sins. So this is the author's advice in terms of how do I calibrate my heart to prophetic ideals? How do I calibrate my heart to prophetic ideals? That is what is required. Now for the companions of the Allahu Anhum, they had the purest of moral compasses because not only did they experience revelation, they enacted with revelation with the Prophet And that is why their understanding of good and evil was at the highest of levels. Which ties in into usul al-fiqh. That is why their consensus, their agreement upon a matter is actually a proof in our religion. Because their ability to understand right and wrong was at the highest level. Different topic altogether. Then number two, we said is establishing moral commitment. Is establishing moral commitment. A man comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, O Messenger of Allah, advise me. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, Qul amantu billah thumma staqim. Say, I have believed in Allah and then I struggle to be upright. I struggle to be upright. Now, this struggle of being upright, there's a hadith where the Prophet wasallam he talks about what caused his hair to go white, what caused his hair to go gray, in fact. And he says, that that which caused my hair to go white and to go gray is the Surah Hud and the, its sisters. And there's a, you know, a narration that talks about which surahs those are. Now, in a narration whose authenticity is, is doubted, and there, there's some dubious nature to it, a sahabi asked the Messenger of Allah, what was it in Surah Hud specifically? What was it in Surah Hud specifically that caused you to, to go gray? And um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to find the exact revelation. And that is when uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, stay committed as you have been ordered. Stay committed as you have been ordered. That was the command in Surah Hud that caused the Prophet Sallallahu hair to go gray. And like I said, it, it seems that this is a, a dubious narration, but this is something that the author mentions. Now, what is the point we're trying to get here? Moral commitment is not a short-term thing. It is a long-term game. Meaning that once I have understood the values and morality, and I'm logically convinced, now how do I stay committed to it? How do I stay committed to it? This is what this discussion is about. And the author advises three things are needed. He says in order for people to be committed to their morality, three things are needed. Number one, certainty. You cannot have any doubts about your morality. You cannot have any doubts that what you believe to be good and bad is actually good and bad. Number two, optimism. Optimism. That if you were to stick to these moral and ethical ideals, then your ultimate outcome will be good. Then your ultimate outcome will be good. And you will have the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And victory will be yours. So an optimism is needed. And then the third thing that is needed, the author uses the term unity. But I think uh, a closer term to what he was desiring is congruence. That, that you are congruent with the outside and inside. Meaning, basically, you're practicing what you are preaching. You're practicing what you're preaching. Your external reality is congruent with your internal reality. And I cannot emphasize the importance of this subject matter. 
where there is a very deep relationship between your Iman and guidance and what you practice. So I want you to give this, I, I want you to understand this example. What does congruence look like? So to believe in the obligation of Fajr, but to not pray Fajr. What is the impact this has on the guidance of your heart? What is the impact that it has on the guidance of your heart? So every morning, you know you have to wake up for Fajr. And every morning, your alarm will go off and you have to make a conscious decision. Will I wake up at that time or will I go back to sleep? We're not going to ignore the snooze button because we know the snooze button is a reality. But let's just choose option one or option two. Because the snooze button, it eventually has to lead to one of the two. Either you pray or you don't pray, right? So the snooze button is just like a, is a distraction. So now you understand this reality. You have to pray or you choose not to pray. What is the impact that this has on your guidance? Eventually, as guidance keeps knocking on your door, if you do not open the door to guidance, eventually guidance retracts and goes away. Eventually guidance retracts and goes away. So every time a moral decision comes your way and you intentionally choose the wrong decision, you're allowing guidance to be snatched away from you. You're allowing guidance to be snatched away from you. So when he talks about congruence, it is that effort that you make to make congruence between what you believe and what you actually act upon. That is what he refers to as unity. I like congruence as a better term. And the more congruent you are in your belief system, the more your guidance increases. The more your guidance increases, the more your basira increases. The more your basira increases, the more you're able to see truth for truth and falsehood for falsehood and thus can follow what is good and abstain from what is bad. Then we talk about moral sensitivity. Moral sensitivity. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tells Wabisa that sin is that which causes you to feel discomfort. Sin is that which causes you to feel discomfort. For the sake of our discussion of discomfort, what we're going to look at is shame, is to feel shame. That is the discomfort that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is referring to. The scholars of Islam have di divided or categorized shame into three categories. Shame with yourself, shame with the people, and shame with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about moral sensitivity, how actively is your heart telling you to be shameful and to be modest? That is what the, the scope of this discussion is. So when you do something wrong, are sirens going off in your head? Hey, I'm doing something wrong, I'm doing something wrong, I'm doing something wrong. Or have you become completely desensitized that to the degree where you're no longer, there are these sirens no longer going off. And those sirens, like we said, are, are shame. So you can see, when human beings lie, the body naturally conveys the lie. Your eyes will dilate, your heartbeat will be very up, and will, will increase, and they're able to detect when you're actually lying. And that's what the lying detecting test is. They develop a baseline of truths. What is your name? What is your born? Where were you born? Things that they can identify know as that's factual. And then they question you on the information that they want to find out about. And if you are lying, it goes off the baseline. Meaning that your body has this even physical compass that it knows when it's doing something wrong. Your body will tell that you're doing something wrong. Now, eventually, if you keep doing wrong and you keep ignoring those sirens, your body stops telling you that you're doing something wrong. So it'll still give off the physical signs, but you're not going to feel it. Now, if you understand this concept, and you understand the concept of shame, you'll understand the problem we have in society right now where modesty and shame is something that is not embraced. And in fact, it is something that is discouraged. And I think we have two extremes where shame is used to shatter and destroy people's confidence. And then this created an exact opposite extreme where shame and modesty 
are actually considered bad things. Where shame and modesty are actually considered bad things. The Prophet wasallam he says specifically, every religion is given a characteristic. And the main characteristic of our religion is al-haya. It is this modesty and shame. And the Prophet wasallam he tells us that once this modesty and shame is taken away, people will do as they please. مِمَّا أَدْرَكْنَا مِنْ كَلَامِ النَّبُوَّةِ الْأُولَى إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتْ That that which has reached us from the statements of the previous prophets is when mankind no longer has shame, they will do as they please. And this is what we're seeing in our day and age, where people have no shame, so they're doing as they please. And we want to try to justify those actions, we want to become desensitized to those actions, but we don't want to embrace shame. So what we want in our discussion today, in this component, is understand the virtue and value of shame. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put shame inside of us, it is something good. And it is created for us to rectify our ways. So you know you're doing something bad, I need to do something differently. But if you keep ignoring it, that shame gets taken away, the heart becomes hardened, and it ignores guidance altogether. So shame is actually a good thing when it's used properly. Now, as a society and as a community, what do we use as mechanisms of shame? So I want you to give you the example of driving. I want you to imagine you're driving and someone cuts you off. What is something that you do to shame this person? You will honk the horn. You're trying to shame this person by honking the horn and letting them know that they're doing something wrong. Now, I want you to imagine if you're one of those drivers that is just constantly honking their horn. Just randomly, for no reason, you're honking your horn. What are we going to think about this person's signs? We're going to completely ignore it. So what we realize is that people that, or a society that uses shaming as a form uh, in its improper place, shame will have no value. Shame will have no value. So shame has to be used in its proper place. When something, someone does something wrong, you have to advise them that they're doing something wrong. If we're constantly condemning people for no reason whatsoever, people will not take that shaming seriously. And it is something that will become annoying and a hindrance, and people will not want to listen to what you have to say. They will not want to listen to what you have to say. So let us get back to these three categories. Let us get back to these three categories. Shame with yourself, it means you hold yourself to a higher standard. You hold yourself accountable. When you do something wrong, you have to, to tell yourself, you know what, I need to do better. I need to be better. And that is what shame with yourself is all about. Shame amongst the people is not only about doing that which is not socially acceptable, but it is also holding yourself to a higher standard amongst the people. And we see this in the Prophet ﷺ on even certain individuals inspired him with further modesty. The Prophet ﷺ was from the most modest of people, but he too was inspired with further modesty. Where Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she narrates, when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came to visit, the Prophet ﷺ didn't move. Omar comes, he sallallahu alayhi wasallam doesn't move. Yet when Uthman radiallahu anhu comes in, the Prophet ﷺ fixes his posture, straightens his clothes, and then Uthman anhu is allowed to enter. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, and she asks, O Messenger of Allah, why did you move when Uthman radiallahu anhu walked in? And he says something very profound. He says, Ala astahi min rajulin, tastahi minhu al malaika. Should I not be shy and modest in front of a man whom the angels are even shy and modest of? Now, how is that developed? That life of secrecy and privacy that you have, you're so sincere with Allah, you're so fearful of Allah, that even the angels become shy and modest in front of you. That they become shy and modest, that Allah's creation that has this desire is able to tame his nafs to such a degree, this is something that naturally instills shyness. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ is referring to, that in a society, there have to be components where we hold ourselves to a higher standard and character and we have to embrace those good and noble characteristics that our society brings to us. 
The bad we ignore and we shun, but in terms of the good we embrace and we implement. And then modesty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is about you understanding that Allah is watching what you do. And I want you to think of, again, let's take the example of driving. You're driving on like Deerfoot, you're driving on Stony Trail. The sign clearly says 110 and you're going like 115, 119 to be really smart. And then all of a sudden you see like this undercover cop car. And you're like, is it an undercover cop car? Is it just a regular car? I don't know, but I'm going to slow down. This, you know, slowing down intentionally is what is meant to happen when you recognize Allah's watching you. That you're living this fast-paced life, but once you realize Allah's watching you, you gotta slow down. And you have to do things properly and do them appropriately. You're gonna put your signal on when you change lanes. You're gonna put your signal on when you're making a turn. You're not going to speed. You're gonna make sure your seatbelt is on. You're not gonna talk on the cell phone because you know this car is watching everything that you do. And for Allah is the greater example. Because Allah is always seeing what we're doing. Allah is always hearing what we're saying. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever knowing of that which we do externally and internally. So that is what shame and modesty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is meant to look like. That if you recognize that Allah is watching and hearing at all times, how does that impact your behavior? How does that impact your behavior? So this is the moral sensitivity that we are referring to. What was number four? Who can remind me what number four was? Moral problem solving. Moral problem solving. So now, how do we choose to solve our problems? How do we choose to solve our problems? There's a statement in fiqh that the true faqih is not the one that knows right from wrong, but the true faqih is the one that knows the greater of the true rights and knows the more harmful of the two wrongs. And that is who the true faqih is. So when we talk about moral problem solving, it is not about knowing right from wrong anymore. What we're looking at for the, soap of our, for the scope of our discussion is that you bring yourself to a frame of mind, yes, this is what is right, but is there a greater right than it that I can follow? This is what is wrong, but is there a greater wrong that I can abstain from? Is there a greater wrong that I can abstain from? So now, I want to give you this ethical dilemma that the scholars of Islam had to deal with. And that is, when you backbite someone, when you backbite someone, in Islam, we know that backbiting someone, saying something about someone which they dislike, is haram. And in order for anything haram that is done to another human being, you are meant to rectify with that human being. You are meant to rectify with that human being. Now, the dilemma over here arises because this person doesn't know that you backbit them, they're still friendly with you, they're still courteous with you, the ties of brotherhood and sisterhood are still there. Whereas if they were to find out that you backbit them, that will break off the ties of relationship, they will become upset, they will no longer respect you, and perhaps may even cut off that relationship. So now you have to make a judgment call, and that is, do I preserve the literal letter of the law, which is go ahead and make this apology, because that is what we're commanded to do, to rectify with people? Or do I look at the greater objective of Islam in terms of establishing relationship and keeping good ties with people and then take another approach where I will seek forgiveness for this person and I will praise this person in the same gathering that I backbit them. What do you do? So this is the moral dilemma. And then the conclusion eventually comes to you need to have a level of insight on the type of person that this person actually is. If they are a person that you feel is very easygoing and doesn't hold grudges, the right thing to do at that time is to apologize to this person for backbiting. But if you feel that this person is someone that is very vindictive, someone that is not easily forgiving, then the greater objective of the sharia needs to take place, which is that you know what, I don't tell this person, but then I take the second route, which is to speak good about them in that gathering and seek forgiveness uh, on behalf of them. And seek forgiveness on behalf of them. So this is what we're talking about in terms of moral problem solving. 
When you come to a moral dilemma, you're not just looking at right and wrong anymore. You're developing the frame of mind. What is a greater good that can be embraced and what is a greater harm that can be abstained from? Now what this is contingent and dependent upon though is you increasing your self in knowledge. What this is dependent and contingent upon is you increasing yourself in knowledge. And then what was number five? Moral assertiveness. Moral assertiveness. So what moral assertiveness is referring to is do we keep our morality to ourselves? Or is this something that we defend and openly bring to the public? And the author's argument is that this is something you have to morally defend and bring to the public sphere. That we cannot have a secularization of Islamic morality where people just keep it to themselves, but rather it has something that has to be proclaimed and brought to the forefront where people will discuss and debate. And that is where the truth of Islam is actually brought forth. So now when you look at the ills of society, when you look at the ills of society, we as Muslims believe that Islam has the solution. But where does the problem lie? There are very few amongst us that are bold enough, that are brave enough, that are knowledgeable enough to come to the forefront of the debate and present the solutions that Islam has to the societal problems. And we've embraced out of fear, perhaps out of lack of knowledge, lack of confidence, that as long as I'm living it by myself, I will be excused. And the answer to that is not true. In fact, this moral discussion is da'wah. It is da'wah. And if no one is giving da'wah, the whole community is sinful. If no one is giving da'wah, the whole community is sinful. So that means it is a communal obligation that we raise from amongst us. Those that are knowledgeable, those that are confident, those that are bold, that can defend the morality and ethics of Islam for the sake of solving the ills of society. Now what I need to understand and what I need everyone to understand here is that let us look at this from a political sphere. Let us look at this from a political dynamic. And we'll get very specific. Let's be honest and specific. We have the liberal government and we have the conservative government. And we're going to use generalizations. These generalizations don't apply to every candidate but they will apply to at least some of the candidates within these two political parties. They will apply to some of these candidates within these two political parties, and we're not mentioning names, we're just talking about the ideology. The conservative political party views Islam as a physical threat, as a physical threat. And that is why anti-immigration policies, that is why branding of terrorism and radicalization, that is why these sort of arguments are used. The liberal government, or the liberal party rather, let's use that term, they view Islam as a social cohesive threat. That Islam is not socially compatible with the values that we stand for. So now, in this political spectrum, when election time comes, these are the, the two parties that we're choosing. One that views us as a physical threat because we're immigrants, we're radicals, we're terrorists. And one that believes we're socially a threat because our understanding of morality and ethics is not compatible with neoliberalism. So now, what do you do in such a situation? This is not advice on politics. We're not getting to who you should vote for. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But what I'm saying is understand the threat and understand the importance of discussion and dialogue. So with the conservative party, if you do not explain what Islam truly is and what Islam stands for in terms of sanctity of life and equality of life and things of that nature, then that threat will continue and you will continue to be perceived as a threat. And then with the other side, even though they may embrace you at a surface level, as soon as you disagree with them on one of their points, then you are no longer socially compatible with them. And this concept of social cohesion is no longer there. So now how do you bring this discussion to the table is about the issue of morality. How do you understand what is good and bad? 
How do you understand what is good and bad? And you further the scope that our understanding of good and bad has to be dependent upon an objective source. It cannot be something that is relative. It cannot be something that is subjective. So that is where this discussion and dialogue needs to take place. And up and until we don't embrace this challenge, two things will continue to happen. Two things will continue to happen. We will continue to be demonized in politics and in media from the conservative party. And then we will be considered to be ba barbaric and backwards with the liberal party. Up and until we don't come to the forefront of the discussion. Up and until we don't come to the forefront of the discussion. Now, what I want to, to share with you at the end of chapter 3, and I know it's 8.54, so I think more than likely we will probably go to 9.10 inshallah, is the conclusion of chapter number 3. He says, one of our pious predecessors said to his son, when your passions call you to a major sin, then cast your gaze upon the heavens and feel shame before those in the heavens witnessing you. And if that does not create a feeling of shame within you, then cast your gaze to those around you on this earth and feel shame before those witnessing you on the earth. And if you do not feel any shame at these two levels, then consider yourself to be from amongst the beasts. Consider yourself to be from amongst the beasts. So this ties back to this concept of, of modesty and, and bashfulness and shame. That if you do not feel any shame from those above you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels, then look to those amongst you. And if you even do not feel amongst the shame amongst the people that you are present in front of, then know that you are no different from the beasts. Know that you are no different from the beasts. Which brings us to chapter number four, which is the concluding chapter which talks about radical change. So now understand the, the, the preface of this book. The preface of this book is you've learned about emotional intelligence and the impact that it has in impacting yourself, your family life, society as a whole. You learned about moral intelligence, that moral intelligence is needed to lead yourself, your family and society in the right direction. How do you get them to that level? Now chapter number four discusses what did the Prophet ﷺ do so successfully that within this short period of time he was able to create this drastic change in society? Drastic change in society where people were burying their daughters to now giving them sanctity. Where people are worshipping multiple idols and now they're worshipping one Lord. Where people are living a life of desires where they're drinking and fornicating as much as they want to now pursuing their desires in a halal and constrained manner. Where people had no consciousness, to now having a consciousness. Where people did not repent, now they're actively repenting. Where people did not respect and honor, to now people respecting and honoring. So how did all of this happen in a short period of time? In the time of the Prophet wasallam, and in the time of the Khulafa. And he summarizes it into three main points. He summarizes it into three main points. Number one is the way the Quran framed knowledge. The way the Quran framed knowledge. And knowledge is framed of, it is of no value if it is not acted upon. Knowledge is of no value if it is not acted upon. So every knowledge that is received has to be acted upon in some way or another. And this is why the Prophet wasallam he sought refuge in Allah from knowledge that does not benefit. He sought refuge in Allah that from knowledge that does not benefit. And we know that the scholar that does not implement the knowledge that they have will have a huge amount of accountability on the Day of Judgment. So knowledge has to be acted upon. Number two is that understanding things have to be a gradual process. Things have to be a gradual process. Now you may be thinking, but isn't it called radical change? That's what the chapter is called. The radical change is not in the time frame, but it is in the methodology of gradual change. And that is what Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says that the first revelations that were sent down were revelations of Jannah and Jahannam. And then Allah revealed the prohibition of alcohol. Had Allah revealed the prohibition of alcohol first, the people would have said, we are never going to give up alcohol. So what this shows us 
is that there's a gradual building of priorities. There's a gradual building of priorities. Now, what is the purpose of this gradual building? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He actually tells us why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Qur'an over 23 years as opposed to just one shot. That why didn't Allah just reveal the Qur'an at once? You know, we would have had the whole manual of Islam in one time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Qur'an to firm the heart of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa to make it steadfast. It is only when you gradually train something that it becomes steadfast. But if you try instantaneous change, it will not be sustainable. It will not be sustainable. Now it is based upon this paradigm, number two, that change has to be gradual, that the author introduces, which I will call point number three, which is double looped learning and single looped learning. Double looped learning and single uh, looped learning. Now, what does double loop and single loop actually mean? So I want you to imagine if the sphere of change has various circles around it. The sphere of change has circles around it. There's one circle and there's two circles. Circle number one is do this and don't do that. Your convictions, your assumptions are not challenged. This is called single looped learning. Single looped learning, do this, don't do that. Your assumptions and convictions are not challenged. Double looped learning is not only are you told do this and don't do that, but your assumptions and your convictions are challenged. Your assumptions and your convictions are challenged. And he says when you look at the teaching of the Prophet wasallam, you will see that he used a combination of the two. He challenged the convictions of the people and then he also told them don't do this and don't do that. And this is what made that radical change. Is that the Prophet wasallam was able to challenge people's convictions, was able to challenge people's assumptions. And when you're able to do that and convince them and then tell them do this and don't do that, that is the recipe for true change. That is the recipe for true change. And then the author introduces point number three um, in terms of single looped and double looped, or he, you can pause and call this, you know, 3A if you want to call it that. He says not only is single looped and double looped learning required for long-term change, but the person conveying the message has to be someone that is trustworthy and has to be someone that genuinely cares. It has to be someone that is trustworthy and it has to be someone that genuinely cares. So now summarizing this as a whole, summarizing this as a whole, change on a societal level needs a strong leader that is knowledgeable, compassionate, and empathetic. This strong and knowledgeable leader will have to challenge people's convictions. He will have to change the way they look at things. He will have to change the way they perceive things. For the sake of the Prophet wasallam, that was getting people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of entering Jannah and abstaining from Jahannam. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone for the sake of entering Jannah and abstaining from Jahannam. And then at the lower level, telling people do this and don't do that. And when you have this on a gradual basis, on a continuous basis, from someone that is uh, knowledgeable, that is trustworthy, and someone that genuinely cares, that is how society is changed as a whole. That is how society is changed as a whole. One thing I want to look at from the life of the Prophet ﷺ is that if you look at the khutbahs the Prophet ﷺ gave, he gave a khutbah once a week on the day of Jummah. Once a week on the day of Jummah. And the khutbahs were very, very short. They were very, very short. Extremely short. And then in Salah, he would recite Surah Al-A'la and Surah Al-Ghashiyah. And that was longer than the khutbah itself. That was longer than the khutbah itself. So now you may think, SubhanAllah, such a short khutbah, long recitation, where is the impact coming from? The impact was coming from that the Prophet ﷺ, he taught people that you have to come to the masjid 
outside of Jummah. You have to come to the masjid outside of Jummah. If you're unable to come to the masjid outside of Jummah, make sure you have a daily reading of the Quran. Make sure you're making your adhkar. Make sure you're making your dua. And for those people that actually came to the masjid, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would discuss with them after every salah, which one of you had a dream? Or which one of you experienced this? Which one of you is fasting today? Which one of you visited the sick today? Which one of you attended a janazah today? This is how he's interacting. So those small dosages of don't do this and don't do that, with revelation coming down, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being the most uh, empathetic of Allah's creation, that is what brought that long-term change. Now, to conclude, what I want to share with you, I cannot express the amount of burden a person feels after reading a book like this. Like you'd think you would be relieved. But after you read a book like this, there's a huge amount of burden on you. After you attend a series like this, I'm hoping you feel some pressure upon yourself. Now what is that pressure meant to look like? Number one, is understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this role model Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not just to love him and to revere him and enjoy his stories but to live up to his example. So meaning we have these huge shoes to fill after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then number two is understanding the importance of empathy with people. In a society where empathy is not valued at all and it is not encouraged at all and you're meant to be empathetic towards people you're, you're swimming against the tide. You're trying to sprint up a hill that is like 89 degrees. That's what it is. That's what you're trying to do. Developing that empathy. And then number three, understanding that we have an obligation towards our society. Understanding we have an obligation towards our community. It's not just enough to live in a silo where you worship Allah by yourself. It's not enough. We are meant to be people of massive change. That change begins with yourself, then it goes to your family, and then it goes to society. There is that order. But to be content with, I'm only going to worship Islam for myself, you've misunderstood Islam if that's how you're viewing it. So yes, it comes with the burden, but it also comes with the solution. Now the, the silver lining on all of this is that when you know that Allah is pardoning and forgiving, as long as you're making an effort, as long as you're trying, you're safe. The problem comes when you're not trying. Because if you try, you make a mistake, Allah will forgive you. But if you're not making an effort to learn, you're not making an effort to, to study the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and see who he was and the change that he made. You're not trying to be more empathetic. You're not trying to become more emotionally intelligent or morally intelligent. You're not trying to collect, connect with the Quran and protect yourself with adhkar. And you're not trying to make an impact in, in society then we should ask ourselves, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? If it's just about eating, sleeping, drinking, enjoying ourselves, as that predecessor said, we're no different than the animals. We might as well have been animals. Anything that I've said that is correct is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and all praise is due to Him. Anything that I've said that is incorrect is from myself and shaitan. And I seek forgiveness from Allah first and foremost and then from all of you. I know it's been... Uh, a hectic four weeks, it's a lot of material, but what I'm hoping is some, that this is something that we'll continue to discuss in our social circles, in our families, as a community. And what I'm also hoping for, inshallah, is that we can become that community after we become those individuals and after we become those families that can solve the, the, the ills of society. Because if you look at our society, our society is very, very sick right now. There are a lot of illnesses. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed us on this earth at this specific time so that we can make those changes and either we become a part of the solution and making that change or we become a part of the problem that's the only two options so i pray that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us the tawfiq to implement everything good that we've learned i pray that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to see people's problems and feel the pain and have the the, the will and desire to change those problems I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us knowledge, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us wisdom, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us the ability to implement the knowledge that we have, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the knowledge that we have a proof for us and not a proof against us. Wallahu ta'ala alam. 
وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم